thank you everyone for joining us today, Tavina and myself. We are really, really happy to have you here to discuss Estates at Crossroads, which is our newest acquisitions in the Atlanta MSA. We're very excited. We love this market. We really like this opportunity. And uh, we're going to walk you through the, the main points that what we believe is important to know. Just so you know what to expect, Vina and I are going to walk you through just a little bit of a background about us. It's I promise it's not going to be long because most of you are already invested with us, so you know us. Um, and then in addition, we're going to kind of talk about the deal, explain what the, the property, you know, explain a little bit about the property and the market. And uh, I'm going to walk you through the business plan, what we're trying to do, what we're planning on doing. Um, talk also about the underwriting and the different classes. But before we're going to talk about all those beautiful things, we're going to uh, talk about the difference between investing in this opportunity and investing in our $100 million fund that we call Rev Fund. Um, so, you know, maybe you want to talk a little bit, a little bit about that because um, I know we've, we've got a lot of questions from uh, investors. Yeah. So, um, and they're all great questions. So we, as you guys know, we have launched our Rev Fund, which launched what, about two weeks ago now. Um, it's a hundred million dollar fund, like Ellie said, and our plan there is to collect uh, five to 10 assets in the fund. Um, and we're going to actually keep targeting the same assets that we've always targeted. So nothing is changing about that. Our business plan isn't changing. Um, I, I get a lot of questions. So now are we only doing Rev Fund versus our direct syndication? The answer is no. Rev Fund is simply a way for our investors to have flexible options for their portfolio. Uh, we got a lot of requests from investors, especially after Element, to have more assets like that, more diversification. They wanted to mitigate any future risk that they see. Um, potentially coming down the road at some point. And so really what we wanted to do was instead of accommodating less investors, we wanted to accommodate more investors. And so we decided to launch Rev Fund. Um, it is, again, a $100 million fund. The minimum investment there is $50,000 for Class B shares, $100,000 for Class A shares. Now, if you are the type of investor that says, hey, you know what, I'm not really interested in doing a fund, I want to pick all of my assets. Maybe you hate investing in Texas and you know that that's on our target markets. Uh, then you can go into each asset individually, the same as it's always been. Nothing changes about that. Uh, from a return perspective, they're going to be pretty similar returns because we're offering both the fund and the direct investment. The, Returns are going to always be fairly similar um, from the overall fund perspective because we target very specific assets on the direct side. So it's going to average out to being right around where any of our direct investments would be. Um, the one thing, the feedback I've been getting from a lot of investors, and Ellie, tell me if this has been the feedback you've been getting, but with Rev Fund, I, I actually had a surprising number of investors prefer Rev because it's kind of a, I'm calling it like a set it and forget it type of investment, right? So if you know you're investing $200,000, $300,000, $400,000 into multifamily in the next 12 to 18 months, but maybe you don't want to look at each individual asset. You don't want to listen to us drone on on these conference calls every time we have an asset come up and you just want, you know that we put out products that you like, then you would really be well suited in the fund. Um, if you're somebody that wants to choose and be hands on with your investments, this is a great option also because you can do a direct investment. So as far as the returns go to kind of like give you a high level overview, our class A shares, it's your 8% preferred return. Uh, minimum investment into REV is 250,000 aggregate across both classes. And in the direct syndication, the minimum, uh, sorry, on in Rev Fund, the uh, minimum is 100,000 for class A shares across both. Both For the direct syndication, it's 250,000 across both. So I'm going to say that again, because I know I messed it up and I want to be clear. So in Rev Fund for class A shares at the 8% PREF, you are looking at a minimum aggregate of $100,000. So you can blend that between class A and class B. You can do 
30% to class A and 70% to class B, um, whatever's comfortable for your portfolio. Uh, same goes for the direct syndication. Uh, the 250,000 can be split across asset classes. Um, the class B shares on Rev, the minimum is $50,000 and it's a 6% preferred return with a 70-30 split after that preferred return. So once you reach your 6% in annualized returns, any remaining cash flow is distributed with 70% going to you as the investor and 30% coming to us as the sponsor. And we have what's called an IRR hurdle, which is set at 12%. Um, and this is true for both of the class B shares on Rev and uh, the estate's direct uh, syndication. Um, and the hurdle is set at 12% IRR. So once investors receive 12% in IRR, then we go to a 50-50 split. The reason we do this and we structure with this waterfall setup and the PREF setup is because it really aligns all of our interests up and down the entire capital stack. So not only are we incentivized to perform above that 6 or 8% respectively, because we don't get any of the profit share until we meet that threshold. Um, we It also incentivizes us to really push even more above the 13%, 12% IRR um, to get to that 50 50 split. And so it's just, a, it's been a really great model. It's been a great experience. When I invest passively, this is the structure I like to see on my investments. Ellie, I'm sure you're the same. Um, and so we really try to treat it, and we invest into all of our own deals. So uh, because we invest right alongside of you, we like this structure. <laughs> yeah. And just the one thing that I would add, because this is a question we got from a lot of investors, um, or is this investment open? through the fund and individually and the answer is yes, you can invest individually in this investment. You can also invest in Rev Fund and that is the fund's first investment. Now moving forward with new deals, it might be part of, of the fund exclusively and it might be open to both individual in, investors and through the fund. Um, it's, it's just going to change. The main difference is that when you invest in this investment, the entire, let's say, $100,000 check that you're writing is going to be invested in this asset versus, you know, in the fund, it's going to be across the board. So we're just added more options for you. It's an it's another vehicle for investment. So if you like this opportunity, you can basically choose whether you want to invest in it directly or if you want to invest in the fund, assuming, of course, that the next um, deals are going to be similar. Um, and the minimums to invest, the minimums are different between the fund and directly investing in estates or crossroads. Um, and maybe we can kind of go over and kind of talk a little bit about the just a general overview um, of estates or crossroads, which, you know, we're extremely excited uh, to present to you today. Yes. Do you, do you want me to get started on that? Yeah, why not? Okay, awesome. So uh, as you guys know, we love Atlanta. Um, we're totally not biased or anything, but the last deal we did together was in October and we closed October of 2020 and it has been doing so well. We've been, we always joke that we're looking for the next element 41. And so we're looking for like element 42 and estates is probably as close as we can get and actually kind of a better asset class um, because of the location. So by way of comparison, um, Element was in an area which had a $57,000 median income. This area has a $93,000 income. So very great tenant population. It's 2002 vintage, 344 units. Um, we're purchasing it for $78.3 million, um, which... I think we absolutely got away with a steal of a deal there because there was a lot of competition around this asset as there usually is on the assets that we're going into. Um, we also are planning to hold this for five years and we're raising uh, 28.6 million in equity, um, which you guys have probably seen already in the offering. And um, it's just, it's a really phenomenal asset. As you guys can see in the pictures here, it's very clean. This is what we like to call like our bread and butter deal, right? It is a true, pure value add deal. There's nothing crazy. There's no like weird things we have to do or anything like that. It's just a very clean, smooth deal. 
like I said, very similar to Element 41, just a newer vintage um, and a higher t- uh, tenant population uh, socioeconomically. Yeah, and Vina and I, we walk a lot of assets and some assets are beautiful and they're even in decent location, but then you look, in, you look at the numbers and you find out that 5%, 11% of the projected income is actually in bad debt, meaning there's a lot of bad debt. There's many tenants that are not paying. And here's what we like to call a clean deal, meaning the tenants are strong, they're solid, they care about their credit score, they pay on time. And that's We're going to touch on the delinquency later on, but we're looking at a deal with very, very little bad debt. Um, the number of tenants that are late, I can count them on my uh, right hand. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the business plan. So it's very, very simple. And I can basically, you know, there are four points when it comes to the business plan. The first one is like we do on, on other assets, we're going to renovate the units. And what I like about this deal is that even the renovated units, some of the, uh, the units have been renovated, even those renovations are very, very light. So you walk into a renovated unit, the first thing you see is carpet throughout, which is the number one thing that tenants actually dislike, especially in that that tenant um, profile. They like wood floor or faux wood wood flooring or vinyl flooring. The um, backsplash is very dated. So the the thinking is basically to renovate 100% of the asset and push rents. So that's the bold, that's bullet point number one. The second part of the business plan is to reduce expenses. We looked at the expense ratio, meaning the uh, amount of expenses compared to the income. And by way of comparison, our portfolio in Atlanta, we have been operating those assets from anywhere between 38 to 47 percent as an expense ratio. So we know how to operate those assets. We know how to do it um, in a way that can drive results. And we're going to implement the same methods, the same systems that we have on other assets in this market. We're going to do the same here and basically reduce expenses. So that's the second low hanging fruit. The third part is that we really want to improve the curb appeal of the property. So landscaping, restrike the parking lot, buying uh, new pool furniture and rebranding, this is all part of our value add plan and that's gonna add to the appeal of the property. It's gonna make it easier to push rents. And the last part of the plan is basically to create additional income. So. One of the things that are really missing there is Amazon lockers and this property where it's located, it's the the tenants that it attracts, the exact type of tenants that like Amazon lockers. And we identified the area in the clubhouse that you see right now on the screen where we can convert one of the rooms that are not being used, add an Amazon locker um, facility and charge uh, fees to the tenants. We're also going to add fenced yards, we're going to offer washers and dryers in each unit and also going to uh, market a tech package that tenants would be able to get for a small fee. So all those things, renovating the units, reducing expenses, improving the curb appeal and adding additional income, such as the Amazon lockers and the fence yards and washers and dryers, all of these are going are designed to increase the net operating income and basically to create a very uh, su- substantial cash flow that we're going to be distributing to investors. Now, there's a lot of things that, like Vina said, that we like about the deal. Um, maybe Vina, I don't know if you want to talk about the few of the things that you specifically like about this deal. Yeah, my favorite thing about this deal was when um, we were first talking about it and we were like, Fina, the tenants here use the tennis courts. And I was like, what? Because if you guys are invested in any multifamily, tennis courts are like the biggest waste of space. And so much so that on Element, we turned it into a sports court because, and even that's not that used. Um, But tennis courts are typically never used. But because the tenant population is at, $93,000 $93,000 of median income. It's they're used for lessons. They're hiring people to come teach them. They're playing with each other on the weekends. And, you know, in COVID it's actually a great outdoor activity. So 
Uh, and what we've seen over COVID is that amenities are, are where it's at. Amenities and uh, suburban migration. We are seeing both of those things being very hot in this market. And this absolutely checks both of those boxes. Uh, another thing I really like about this, again, super biased, but my sister lives like 20 minutes away from this asset. So I'm leaving for due diligence. Um, and so when I get over there, I get to stay with my sister and it's really close by. Um, it's in Gwinnett County, which is one of the nicest counties in Atlanta. There's four major hospital systems there, which is what drives the median income because there's a lot of healthcare workers um, and they're typically less uh, susceptible to changes in the economy or anything like that. So again, another positive for us from the tenant base perspective. Also, for those of you that are invested in Element with us, having two assets of this size in the same market is a really big win because now this becomes a potential for us to exit in a portfolio, which not only get, could give us the returns that we're projecting, but it could also boost our returns because of the size of the assets. Because It becomes much more attractive to family offices, uh, institutional investors, life insurance companies. So it now what we're doing is we're actually starting to get some additional benefits of just having a larger presence in this area. So those are my favorite things about the asset. And there's a lot of them, but those are my favorites. <laughs> um, so I can talk a little bit about what I like about the asset. First and foremost, this is owned by, this asset is owned by an institutional seller. And it means that they've kept the property at really, really good condition. The roofs were all new in 2016. That's a major cost on our CapEx budget that we do not need to carry. So the, the asset in itself is very solid. We're talking about 96% average occupancy. This asset, unlike some assets that we've looked at, this asset hasn't suffered from any fluctuations in occupancy. We're talking about a, an asset that was that basically the current seller was able to push rents by five over five percent in the last three quarters on average. So we already see a proof of how this asset is being performing during COVID, and that's a really really. Um, positive indicator of how the asset would Im improve and would even be get better once we renovate the units. The income, if you we would be analyzing the the financials, income grew seven percent in the past twelve months. So even during COVID, the asset is highly occupied. Rents keep going up. Income in general keeps going up. This is an asset that is more likely to be a solid investment during COVID and coming out of COVID, ho hopefully very soon. Um, and it's pretty, you know, one of the reasons why the asset is solid, A, it's because the seller is a, is a good seller, but also like Vina mentioned, the tenant base is very strong. We're talking about tenants that are in the medical field, tech jobs, business owners. There's only five to six people right now that are late to pay rents. And that's, extremely low, um, which means, you know, we're getting a pretty much we're getting a clean asset. And the main goal is just to push the, the expenses down, renovate, make the property look nicer and push rents. Um, and as I mentioned, it's it, the value add play here is very solid. So we were every time we, we look at a property, we don't always just look at the reports our teams call all the comps, all the competitors in the area and ask them, how much do you charge for rent for one, two and three bedrooms? What's included in the rent? What's not? What's your innovation scope? We don't take any, any uh, uh, software and, and rely on it solely. We do, but, but not solely. So we have our own intelligence and we were analyzing the market. The, comp the competitors are their rents are higher by $173 all the way to $299 more than this asset. So even if we don't do anything, there's still room to push rents. And the asset that is charging $299, it's an older asset. It's an asset that is about five years older than this asset. Now, in, in addition, um, so even though we can push rents, we didn't 
we didn't choose $299 when we underwrite the deal. We chose $128 as our premiums just to be on a safe side, just to remain conservative, which is why I always say my, that, that our underwriting is semi worst case scenario. I, do I think that $128 as premium, is it easy to get? I don't use easy in real estate. I think it's very reasonable. Is it the bottom of what we can get as premium? I do believe so. And, you know, our other asset, the one that Vina talked about, Element 41, we got, um, we're pushing rents between 9 and 32%. We had last week, we got 32%. It was over 32%, but 32 point something, 32, I think, 0.4% rent increases. So, and, and it was close to $400. So assuming only $128 in an area that is even stronger, I think it's very, very doable. And it just speaks about how conservative the deal is. And I want to say a few more words about the conservative underwriting. And I can talk about underwriting for hours. I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want you guys to, to fall asleep. But besides the average premiums that are at $128, which is very reasonable, the concessions right now that the property, uh, the property is offering no concessions. There's no, no, they're not adjusting their prices because they have really strong demand. Even though concessions are at almost 0%, we are accounting for some concessions just to be on a safe side. And also, if you look at the NOI, the net operating income, we're only accounting for 1% NOI growth between the current operations and year one. Again, there's a lot of meat on the bone. There's going to be a lot of potential to grow the income, but we, we like to adjust our expectations and adjust the numbers down when it comes to the income we can get just to see, okay, even if we don't do a great job some, or something happens, we're barely moving the NOI in, year, in the first year of operations. Is this a good investment? Can we hit 6% to class B and 8% to class A? And when the answer is yes, we know we have a great deal. And one more thing I actually wanted to piggyback on what you just said. Um, in operating other assets in this market, we've actually been able to make some pivots and changes to our business model um, that saved us quite a significant amount on the CapEx side. And so as we've been operating and really diving deep into this market and deepening our relationships here, we've actually gotten um, a lot better quotes on vendors. Uh, we've actually changed our strategy a little bit with regards to uh, managing renovations. And so a lot of the best practices that we put into place are going to seamlessly integrate over here because the assets are very similar. Um, Ellie, I will let you share about the uh, pricing change that we saved at Element and how bringing someone in house has kind of changed things for us. Yeah, we when we started managing assets, we basically had the local team, the asset, uh, the property management team who are sitting in a leasing office, run also the CapEx projects. And then we figured out that if we were to bring a construction manager or a project manager, then we pay them a little bit extra, but they can really make sure they can make sure that we are um, cutting costs significantly. So just on element, we were looking at a bid uh, to restrike the parking lot. It's a large property and it's 494 units. Um, so slightly bigger than this one. And there's a lot to restrike. And the uh, the bids that we got were around one hundred thousand dollars. Then we hired a very experienced local um, construction slash project manager, and he was able to reduce those uh, bids to $70,000. So we just saved $30,000 on CapEx, which is huge. When we exit and sell the deal, and that's the same for states at, at Crossroads, every dollar that we can save in the CapEx, we're not going to do a 30-70 split. We're going to give 100% back to investors. And with deals that we're exiting, we're exiting two deals in Atlanta right now. That's exactly what we do. Every dollar we saved, we have several hundred, uh, hundred thousands of dollars that we're going to pay back to investors because it's money that, you know, we were able to save and we're happy to return to investors. We're not taking any cut of it. 
Yep. And I, I love that. For me, that's like one of the biggest benefits of having concentration in a singular location. Um, you know, and again, it goes back to if that is attractive to you, then going directly into the syndication maybe is the best route. If you're looking for a diversification across multiple assets and potentially multiple markets, then rev fund also makes sense. So it's really dependent. You could split between the two. You don't have to go all into one or the other. Um, so it's really up to you and your portfolio and what makes sense for you. Um, so I want to kind of go back to what the class A and class B investors are looking at in this deal. And I'll talk about it again in terms of the direct syndication model and um, along with Rev, and I'll talk about kind of the differences there. So the class A investors for the direct model, the minimum investment is $250,000 aggregate. So across your investments, you can split $100,000 at class A and $150,000 at class B, whatever's comfortable for your portfolio. Um, on Rev Fund, that minimum is $100,000. And that's, again, aggregate between the two classes. Um, the Class A shares, no matter which one you're in, are getting an 8% preferred return. So you're getting a little bit of a higher return, but you don't get any upside on the back end when we sell the asset. So if that's something that's important to you, your Class B shares are really what's going to be more attractive. And so on the Class B shares, uh, for Rev, the minimum investment there is $100,000. Uh, uh, sorry. For this direct syndication, the minimum investment there is $100,000. For REV, the minimum investment is $50,000. Um, again, once you hit those minimums, you can sh split between the two. So if you hit the Class A minimums, you can put some into Class B and some into Class A. On Class B shares, you're getting a 6% preferred return. That means 100% of profit is paid to you as the investor until you hit a 6% return. After we achieve that first threshold, then we split 70-30. So investors get to take 70% of any cash flows above and beyond the 6 and 8% respectively. Once we hit a 12% IRR, then we go to a 50-50 split. Typically that happens on some kind of a large capital event. It doesn't usually happen during the life of the asset, but you know, with 32% rent increases on unrenovated units, who knows when that'll happen. Uh, but I, I say this to say that there are different investment options. And um, I, I see some questions here about um, why there was a switch from element to this. And really, uh, the, the changes that you're seeing and the subtle changes you're seeing are a multitude of factors. Uh, number one, it's a sign of where we are in the market. It's what we feel very comfortable knowing we can achieve. We like to under promise and over deliver. The minimums have changed because we do a heavy analysis on our investors. Um, we actually keep KPIs of where our investors are tracking, what their investments are. And this is actually the best way for us to offer diversity to our investors without um, hurting our ability to continue scaling the business and continue performing on the asset. So in order to concentrate efforts to the right areas and locations from all different aspects, uh, we've changed the minimums, but that's why Rev is a lower minimum because we know it's important that investors still have that fifty and hundred thousand dollar option, um, and it's important to us, right? Because we want our investors to have what makes sense for their portfolio, and this really offered a lot of options for a lot of our investors. But most of our investors are actually comfortable at those higher minimums, so we thought that this was a great way to make everybody happy all at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. Anything that you want to cover before we move to the uh, Q&A? I see some more quick questions here. Um, yeah, so I, I do get asked, are we distributing monthly, quarterly? How does this work? Um, we will be distributing on this asset monthly. Um, we will also be distributing in Rev monthly. Um, you know, I'm the one that does the distributions right now because Ellie and I are both control freaks. And so it has to be a partner only on the bank accounts. And so both of us are the only ones that touch them. Um, so we do distribute on a monthly basis. I will remind you guys as you're wiring um, in your wires, if you have any doubts about where the money is going to or the wire instructions, please confirm either with Jeanette or Ellie or myself. Um, you guys all have our phone numbers or our email addresses, um, but try to confirm with us verbally if there's any concern. Um, we do send it securely, so it should not be an issue, but uh, you can never be too safe when you're transferring these sums of money. And we take, you know, investor funds very seriously. 
Uh, the other question I get is, um, how can we reserve our spot? Um, in the email that you received from respectively either Blue Lake or Vive, um, there should be a spot where you can go in there and click to either view the offering or view the investment um, the investment location. So it should be in the email that you received that got you here. It's all in the same email. We will be sending out this recording so you will get a chance to watch anything you missed or rewatch anything uh, at a later time. Um, but I think those are the really the big ones. The other question I've been getting a lot that maybe we should hit on a little bit is with Rev Fund um, and really how the capital works because it's a hundred million dollar fund. We're raising twenty nine or twenty eight point six six million here. How does it work if we have a hundred million dollars and we have to deploy it and we're looking at a six percent return? So to answer that question, right now Rev Fund shares are at a thousand dollars a unit. This is the lowest that they're ever going to be because as we continue to perform, the risk of the asset becomes less because you're already cash flowing from assets that have been performing for theoretically three, six, nine, 12 months, 18 months. So the way that we um, allocate for that risk is we increase the share price as the fund continues on. Now, as we get more funded on the rev side, we may close a fund at any time. So a lot of investors that are interested in Rev Fund are getting in now so that it, if it closes in the future, they're already invested in. Now, if we're still open in the future, you can always add investments later, even at a higher share class. It's completely up to you. So the way it works is let's say that we are raising, let's say $20 million is going into this deal. And that's not the actual number. I'm just using a round number. Um, so let's say $20 million is going into this deal. When we get close to being funded, we are going to stop accepting investments at that same share class and we're going to pause our investment opening. And so once that happens, you really won't be able to get in until we open it again. Um, the reason we do that is because we, we don't want to have $100 million of capital that you're expecting a 6% return on and we're not able to deliver. So we're constantly underwriting on the back end. We're constantly tweaking projections. Um, we're always talking about the strategy around it. And we're always looking at what it looks like at, as a whole. So not just any singular asset, but also Rev Fund as a whole entire fund. So we will be controlling how many funds come in and out of the fund at any given time. And so that's why it's the same as our syndications. Um, I know it's frustrating, but we do we do tend to overfund and we do tend to fill up very quickly. Um, in that we have we sent out our email 48 hours ago, less than 48 hours ago. And we are 48.3% committed. Um, and I expect after this call, we'll see an increase in commitments. And definitely by the weekend, once anybody who couldn't actually make this live, um, once they get a chance to listen to the recording, I fully anticipate us to get closer to being committed or overcommitted. So um, as you guys know, we tend to overfund our deals. So if you are interested, um, it's a good time to make that soft commitment. We do... Um, we, we will make sure we answer any questions you have. So even if you're making that soft commitment and you still have an outstanding question, we will make sure we answer those. Um, Ellie, did I hit everything? Yeah, I think so. I see some picture, I see some, uh, sorry, some questions. Um, what we did skip on this call is just a background about us, assuming that everyone knows us, but there are some new investors on the call. So real quick, it's only gonna take 90 seconds. Um, basically, I'm the owner of Blue Lake Capital. I started my career as a real estate lawyer, then transitioned to property management to get a, a little bit of the uh, get on the action. And it was really interesting. Uh, and then um, went to MIT, got my MBA degree and transitioned once again for the last time to mm -hmm multifamily acquisitions and investment. I invest passively on each and every single of our deals. And we're affiliated with a family office um, that is also an investor on every deal. Um, and we're, we're signing on the loan. So I'm committed um, on every loan. We're guaranteeing the loan. Um, and we own about 320 million in asset under management, not including this one and um, above uh, 2,000 units across um, the U.S., um, uh, across three to four markets right now. Awesome. I'm Bina Jetty. Um, I'm the owner of Vive Funds. And similar to Ellie, I started in the corporate world. I took the shortcut into real estate, though, because my mom is a real estate investor. So 
kind of grew up in this background. Um, my family is pretty big in real estate, or they were, now they've divested, now they invest into all of our deals. Um, similar to Ellie, I also invest in all of our deals alongside of our investors. We don't believe in t- asking you to believe in our project if we don't believe in it ourselves. So Ellie and I always inv- co-invest. We've done, um, is this our fifth project together? Six? Fifth or sixth? Sixth one, I think, yeah. Yeah, a fifth or sixth project together. Um, we've known each other for years now and we work really well together. So it's just an extra added bonus to also liking the asset and the numbers working out is that we get to work together uh, very closely. I graduated when I was 20 years old with my degree in finance. Um, thought I was going to do something totally revolutionary and not be part of my family's business. And so I went to corporate real estate and <laughs> worked for somebody else, made them a lot of money. I ultimately left uh, Tishman Spire, where I had a billion dollar asset that I was on the management team for uh, in Washington, D.C. I left in 2012 uh, to start investing for myself. And so my husband and I uh, have found it to be a really great way to get some financial independence. He's a physician. He's an anesthesiologist. And now he's a part time anesthesiologist. Uh, And so it's just a really good way for us to gain passive income. Similarly, we invest passively our portfolio after this deal, it'll be just over the half a billion dollar mark. So it's like a milestone asset for us. Um, And we have about just over 3000 doors right now. So this will put us closer to 3,500 doors across the US. And I'm just, this is actually one of the nicest assets we've ever looked at. Um, In fact, and Ellie, I haven't even shared this with you, but I was working on the PPM with our attorney and he was like, Vina, is it just me or is this like one of the nicest assets you guys have looked at? <laughs> I was like, no, 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 it's true. He's like, yeah, I thought so. And I was like, good, you're ready. That means you're doing enough PPMs for us that you're starting to know kind of like what our projects look like from a portfolio perspective. So, um, but we're really excited about this asset. I leave for due diligence. Um, I'm leaving actually tomorrow. We're starting on Monday, first thing in the morning. Um, and so it's going to be you know, on long few days, but we're going to get everything knocked out. We're walking with multiple teams. Teams are already ready to go. Lenders already meeting us out there to get all of the environmental and everything started. So we're excited. Yeah, that's, um, that's great. I mean, we, we like, I like this asset and and like uh, Vina said, what's great about it is that it, it looks great. It attracts tenants, but there's still a lot of room for value add. And as you can see in the picture here, One of the most uh, beautiful parts of the property is the walking trails. And a lot of tenants with dogs just like to take their dogs or jog. This this basically goes around the property, which is pretty unique. In COVID environment, everyone got a new appreciation for the outdoors. And this is just one of those things um, that uh, that makes basically this this asset unique. I want to go over the Q&A. I see some interesting questions. Before I start that, as a next step, if you're interested in investing in this deal, states at Crossroads, the next step would be to reach out to me or to Vina and basically say, hey, I'm interested and we can get the process started. Um, if, if you're on both of our um, lists, there's, there's a link to uh, commit a, uh, a soft commit, to uh, submit a soft commit, so you can do it as well. Um, Let's say question, uh, what's the turnover of tenants and how long do you project the renovations will take? Turnover is uh, is actually, it's a pretty good figure. Between 60 and 70% of current tenants remain and renew their leases, which is, is great. Um, sometimes we like to push a little bit tenants out because we can get higher rents if we can renovate. And when I say push ten- tenants out, I mean, increase rents to the same level as if we were to renovate the unit and and get the premiums and some of them actually stay which i'm it always surprises me (laughs) Um, how long do you project the renovations will take historically and just by looking at the renovations in the atlanta market we um basically takes us between seven and ten days it could be faster with the construction manager the project manager that we're going to um hire for underwriting purposes, we we take into account 30 days, just to be on a safe side. We never got to 30 days, never even got to 21 days. It's normally very, very quick, seven to 10 days. We, we, we have a, a process where all the vendors come in, they take measurements, 
And then once a unit is becoming available, they know what is the, the unit type and they basically know exactly what materials, what the size and uh, the dimensions of materials to, um, to order and we can get everything very quick. So it's part of that uh, processes that we have in place. Um, another question from Brian is, can you speak of, on the management team for this asset? So we are working with Rangewater. They're a very, very large property management company. They have presence across 80 different cities in the U.S. and they have been managing about 56,000 units. Um, the, the benefit of working with them is that they actually, they are also owners of real estate and they have about 5 billion uh, invested in, in real estate. And that means that you, we get a property management company that understands things through an owner's perspective. And that's huge. They know how we see it because they see it in a very similar fashion. And uh, so that's basically we're work, working with Range Water. That's the company that we are working with. Um, another question: If um, is the preferred return a return of the capital or return on capital? Um, and so in that case, and maybe Vina, you want to take this one? Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So um, for for all intents and purposes, it's actually kind of the same in our deals. And this is a great question because it's not true of every deal you'll invest into. For our deals, it's six of one, half a dozen of the other, because we do count it as a return of capital. So we do reduce the capital balance. But when we underwrite and when we show you our pro forma projections, it's based on 100% of the principal remaining in the deal the entire hold period. And it, this is important because what you'll see in a lot of uh, sponsors opportunities is that they will reduce the capital balance and then they'll pay the pref based off of that. We don't do that. So actually your return becomes much higher because we start paying on a lower capital balance. So it's a return of principle. And really it's, we, we talked to the tax strategists about this like ad nauseum when we were trying to figure out which one to really choose. And it doesn't really matter a whole lot because of how we underwrite our deals. Um, however, if we were to pay it as a return of capital versus, or when we're paying it as a return of capital versus a return on capital, it just kind of defers the taxes a little bit further down the road. Um, so it, it doesn't really matter a whole lot from like a practical purpose, but for um, information purposes, it, it is a return of capital. Yeah. So basically if, if you're in class B, for instance, six and you've invested hundred K you're going to get 6% on hundred K every basically year over year. We're, we're not playing, you know, those games. Um, I see a, a few good questions. Um, one of, if the property overperforms, will there be any, be any chance for larger annual preferred returns? So there will be, if we overperform, that's the difference be, between class A and B. Class A is getting 8% pref. It's a bigger, it's, it's a higher return. If the property overperforms, the class A does not enjoy the added cash flow. Class B is willing to get 6%. But if we are going to overperform, then the 6% can also be, can become 6.5% or 7% because they they enjoy the benefit, the upside once we overperform. And right now, um, on all of our assets in Atlanta, we are actually overperforming. Um, another question is if you go through the fund, can we do 50K in class A and 50K in class B? You can do that. So in aggregate, it's, we're talking about 100K. You can do that if you invest in this deal specifically because um, for class A, the minimum is 100K. In no, the in, in the red fund. Oh, See, sorry, I'm in the fund. Yeah, the other way. You're right. You're right. I, I got, I got, uh, I typed it into the chat. So everyone was clear. So yeah, in rev fund, you can do that. You can split between, you can do 50, 50, you could do 75, 25. What you cannot do is like 37,000 and then 63,000. Cause that is a nightmare for me to calculate. So increments of 5,000, you can split in the fund in um, the direct syndication if you invest an aggregate of 250,000, you can choose where that capital goes. 
Yep. Um, another good question is, and I think some of you are, are uh, thinking that if this is such a nice property, what's, isn't there a, a limited value add? Well, um, this asset, as you can see, it's, it's a nice property. It's definitely not 2021. So it has been, uh, it has been here for, uh, for a while, but there is a value add and potential. And we basically see it because we, analyze the competitors and we see that this asset is not charging as much as much as it could be because the other comps and some of them are older they're basically charging a higher rent and that shows us that there's still room to grow and even though the asset is beautiful in the you know the outside is is pretty beautiful um the oh, sorry the um interior does not really match the exterior. So the interior is, like I mentioned, there's carpet throughout. From my experience, tenants, that's the first thing they look at. They don't want to live in a carpeted apartment. Um, and, you know, that's one of the things that they look at. And so there's still room to modernize the interior and to match the interior to the exterior that is already beautiful. Um, there are also some small projects like you can see here, um, in uh, on the uh, on the screen, you see that the um, the the uh, some of the things needs a little bit of a touch up and color and some greenery. So there are some things to do to make it even prettier. So definitely, there's definitely a um, a potential to add value, even if the property is beautiful. Um, and some properties they they don't look good. And the numbers still don't work, even though you may think, hey, there's an opportunity to make it make the asset look nicer, but the comps are not supporting it, meaning there's no room to grow uh, the rent. So, uh, but good question. That's a great question. And, and it's one that is worth asking on every single deal because you want to make sure that the assumptions make sense. Um, Ellie, did we talk about the reserves on this asset, how much we're raising the reserves? Um, no, we have not. So we basically for, um, and I don't have the numbers right, right now in front of me for the, uh, for the CapEx, but we have about almost a million dollars in reserves. Um, and there's also a small reserves that I'm not even counting here. Um, and what we do every time we have the CapEx budget, we sit down with the property management company. They know every month what they need to do. They know what to prioritize, when to start a certain job, when to finish it. And once we have savings, we just keep it. You know, I like to keep reserves at all times. And if we see that we're sitting on too much cash, then we we may distribute uh, some of it back to investors. But yeah, we have about we have around a million dollars in reserves. Yep. And then I have the capex budget in front of me, so it's three point one million on capex with very minimal amount to deferred maintenance. Because as Ellie said earlier, it's an institutional seller. It the property is really nice. It's well taken care of. These are very minor cosmetic exterior renovations. Um, so the majority of this is being spent on the interior renovations, as we discussed before. Um, okay, so there's a question here on, is it possible to invest in REV for less than 50,000, meaning buying a few shares since the unit share is at 1,000? So the answer is, is it is not. Um, we, quite frankly, are not set up to the scale where we can accommodate $1,000 or $2,000 investments. And so our investments really are set at a price point, which allows us to give you guys proper customer service, proper attention. Um, we want to make sure that we're doing things right. So unfortunately, as much as we would love to take a thousand dollar investments, we are not able to accommodate that at this time. Um, so investment minimums are 50,000 in rev and a hundred thousand in the estates direct deal. Um, and if you guys have not invested with us before, we do. Uh, we are doing a 506C um, exemption from the SEC. And so this deal is only open to accredited investors. Um, unfortunately, the SEC is very strict and they make us do this. So this is not us doing this, but you have to get a third party verification. Um, Ellie and I both have a form that you can send to either your CPA your attorney, a broker dealer, or another uh, financial advisor that's registered with FINRA. And essentially to qualify as an accredited investor, you have to have $200,000 
of income for the last two years with a reasonable expectation of maintaining the same income or 300,000 if you are married. So depending on which, if you're married or single, the, inv- uh, the minimum income changes. Alternatively, you can have at least a million dollars of net worth, excluding your personal home. Um, and that also qualifies you as an accredited investor. There are a few other ways that you can be accredited, but like 99% of our investors are going to fall into one of those two categories. If you believe you fall into a different category, let us know. Um, we will help, um, we'll help give you the form so that you can have whoever um, is signing off on it. You, know, you can direct them to the right place to make sure that you're getting um, your accreditation verification. Once we have that, um, we will make sure we have that in place and then you can be invested into the fund. So just to be really clear, unfortunately, the SEC does not allow us to take even one unaccredited investor. So my best friend, if she's not accredited, as much as I love her, I cannot take her into the investment. So um, that's just something to be cognizant of as you're um, looking at our deals. They are 506C raises. Yeah, and I I think we pretty much covered um, most of it. So as I mentioned before, if you made a decision that you would like to invest either in in this deal, either through a rev fund or directly in estates at Crossroads, just reach out to me and to Vina so we can get you started. Um, We are 48.3% committed by now. So we expect this to fill out pretty quickly. We're closing on uh, by the end of June. So June 30th, this is closed. I believe that in the next couple of probably the next week or so, we're still going to be raising the capital. And then um, once it's going to fill out, the the capital is going to be fill out, um, we're not going to accept any more investments. Um, we may open um, a wait list and we have been on other deals. We have been overfunded on every deal. And we assume that it's going to happen on this one. I'm not trying to rush you into making a decision. If you're not comfortable, you absolutely have to be comfortable with the decision you're making, but just keep in mind that this is filling up pretty quickly. Um, and for those who um, who weren't able to make it on time, which you're probably not hearing me at this point live, uh, we're going to record, this is recorded and we're going to send an email later tonight or tomorrow with the recording so you can review it again um, and, you know, play it if, if, you, uh, if you couldn't attend today. Yes. Yes, we're very excited about this deal. And thank you for being, for uh, spending uh, your uh, Thursday evening with us. I really appreciate it. Um, And uh, hopefully I'll I'll see uh, your emails coming up pretty soon. Thanks, guys. Take care. Have a good night. Bye, everyone. 